Restoring Place Church, the church of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Dream Center, is a place where we make disciples of Christ, teach and train them to live as children of God, and to thrive in who He created them to be. We believe that this is the best time on earth to be alive, to experience the end time harvest of souls for the kingdom of God. Get ready to be renewed, recharged, and restored to go out and take the gospel to your world. Let's join our service already in progress. Brother Hagen was, before he moved to Tulsa, I heard this story this week, I gotta share it with you, <clears throat> because it's really cool. God called him, well, some of his folks and his bookkeeper were in Tulsa, so he went there to do something, and uh, I guess not Charlie Wesson, I think his name was, whatever. He said, I wanna show you a building. He said, no, nah, no, nah, well, I'll go look at it, but we're not moving from Garland, Texas. We're going to stay in Garland. We've already got it figured out. We're going to stay there. He said, yeah, but this is T.L. Osborne's old headquarters. And <clears throat> if you knew T.L. Osborne, he had a miraculous ministry, particularly overseas, where deformed babies were returned to normal in his arms as he prayed for them. I mean, just wonderful stuff. And he went into that place. And when he went into that, <clears throat> that building that T.L. Osborne had, he said something went off on him like a green light. It wasn't God speaking, but God leading him. God will speak to every one of you and tell you things and lead you places you don't know. And he said he knew that this was the place. But he said, no, nah, no, nah, we don't want this. And he went back home that night and went back to bed. And his wife went to bed. He says, I couldn't go to sleep because I kept something kept bothering me about this thing that God told me. He said, now, Lord... Are you trying to tell me, I don't want to miss you, but we got this all figured out. We got this figured out, me and my wife, and staying in Garland, Texas, and we're gonna, everything that you call us to do, we do. He said, but God says, I'm going to give you that building. <laughs> Brother Hagin said, well, I believe it when I see it. <laughs> I believe it when I see it. He said, that wasn't much faith there. He said, but I wasn't wanting to move. God said, I'm going to give you that building. Wow. Wow. And Brother Hagin said, well, I hear you. I'll believe it when I see it. And God said, you just watch. Oh, and you know what? He said, that's all I did was just watch God move and brought him that building. Wow. Wow. Pretty amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> God will speak to you. When Karen and I began to walk with the Lord back in 94, we didn't know God would speak to us. In fact, if we thought we heard somebody say, God's speaking to me, you thought that person was crazy. <laughs> but when you pick up the word of God, just God speaking to you. Right? You want to hear from God? Put your nose in this book. Come on, come on. Don't wait for a special word, because if you don't have this word in your heart, somebody will speak to you. It may not be God. Right. And the way to discern between who is God and who's not is no knowing the word of God, right? God and his Holy Spirit will never do anything contrary to what his word says. All right. In fact, it'll agree with, because he agrees with himself. Amen. And God wants to speak to you. He's got a purpose for your life. You're not here by accident. <clears throat> come on, come on. Now, I'd like to think that God brought every one of you here. That would be perfect peace for me. And if you're supposed to be here, then you need to be here, whether you want to stay here or not. And if you're not supposed to be here, you shouldn't be here. And if, you don't, if you're not supposed to be here and you stay here, you're probably going to cause problems. Amen? Amen? But find out what God wants you to do and go do it. And don't judge it on what you think you've already got figured out or what you think you know or what you think, you think God needs to do for you. Amen? But you're not here by accident. You're not here on this earth just by accident. Jesus told a parable about a, a man who had great riches and he left to go on a trip soon to return. He gave one man ten talents, gave one five talents, and gave one man one talent. When he returned, he wanted to see what they had. The guy that had 10 made another 10. He said, enter in, you faithful servant, for you've been faithful over literally, you'll be faithful over nations, you will rule nations. Wow. One that had five brought back the five, plus he made five. He said the same thing to him. The one guy he gave one talent to went and buried it. And then when, he, when the master returned, he went and dug it up and brought it back to him. And said, look, I know that you're a 
tight man and you, you sew where you don't read. But that's, a, that's a kingdom way right there. He said, so I saved this town and I buried it for you. And he said, you unfaithful, unjust servant. You didn't do At least you could have put it in the bank and made interest on it. <clears throat> I tell you that because God has a purpose for your life. Amen. To come into his kingdom. We've been told or we've been thinking that we get saved and we just hang out until Jesus comes or until we go be home with him. And that's not it at all. <laughs> if you read the four Gospels, you may think that. When you start reading the epistles, you find that you are saved for a reason. Amen. Amen. Saved for a purpose and a reason. God prophetically spoke to us about us in Isaiah 60 and 61. I'll get to those when I can today. He also spoke to us through the disciples in the Great Commission. This is from Matthew 28, 18. There's four Great Commissions, maybe five, you count the book of Acts, where Jesus said, go do something. Now y'all hold it down. Behave yourself. This is the house of the Lord, amen. amen. <clears throat> but you were called to come into the kingdom for purpose, yeah. by design. Yeah. Ephesians 2 says God has a plan for your life, and he says live in the good life that God prearranged, planned, and made ready for you to live. Woo! That's for you and me. Every one of us has a plan. And I don't care where you came from. Yeah. I don't care how bad your background is. I don't care how little you've learned. I don't care what you've done up to this point. When you come to the kingdom, your life begins. You're not waiting for eternity to begin when you go to heaven. Your eternity begins when you get born again. Come on, come on. And you can't do anything to get born again on your own. You're born again because you, by faith, believe what God did for you and me. Amen. And then we yield ourselves and declare Jesus Lord of our life. And we believe that God raised him from the dead. Then we're saved. Guess what? You just walked in the door. Well, that's good news, but if that's where you stop, that ain't good news. Amen? <clears throat> You're called to come into the kingdom. Imagine this. Now, I use this analogy a lot. Let's say you go join the army, right? You go down to the recruiting office, you sign up. They say, yep, all right, you're in. On this date, show up to this base camp. Right. Well, you just join the army, and you just run around. I'm in the army. I'm in the army. If you never go to base camp, you're going to be AWOL, first of all. God won't make you hold you AWOL. You'll be absent without leave, but he gives you a chance to make it up. But you're called to come into the kingdom for such a day as this to fulfill your part of the Great Commission. Hallelujah. Every one of you. Hallelujah. There's, no, there's no second class citizens in the body of Christ. We all come in as buck privates, however. Come on, come on. And then we come in and we start working, putting our hands to the plow and serving God. Actually co-laboring with him. Amen. <clears throat> John Wesley, the founder of Methodist Church, said this, it seems as though God's limited by our prayer life. He can do nothing for humanity unless somebody first asks him. Amen. We are his body on the earth and com the completion of him that fills all things with his power flowing through us. The relegated, the relegated and authoritative power on this earth is by God through his church. Not the governor, not the mayor, not the city council, not the, not the uh, board of the counties, not the state governor, not the state legislature, the state, what, uh, the government, the United States president, and the, all those, name them all. <clears throat> God's not gonna hold them responsible for the state of affairs on this earth. He's gonna hold you and I, the church, the body of Christ. Wow. And you're called for purpose and plan. And I don't really care what background you've come from, what color you are, how old you are. You may be saying, well, I'm 70. I've wasted all my life. Well, it's about time you got online. Amen? Oh, Jump in where you are and then let God grow you. Amen. Amen. And let me get another religious thought out of it. It's not your idea and it's not your way. It's his way. Period. Come on, come on. Period. So many people come in and say, well, you know, I'm called to do this. And they won't even help you clean the bathroom. They won't even help you straighten up the chairs. They raised up in the early church deacons to help feed the people yes. because the ones that were called to minister, now they didn't just start ministering off the bat. They'd been with Jesus for three and a half years. 
they served their time. They served the man of God. Amen. And they grew with him. Yeah. Don't think you're going to... You know what? I'm in the restaurant business too. And people go to culinary school and they think they come out of culinary school, they're going to go run the kitchen. They're so crazy. <laughs> All you did was get started on it. At the beginning, understand what it takes to do it. I mean, some of these guys go to Johnson Wells and some of these other schools, they think as soon as I get it, I'm going to be a sous chef or an executive chef. <sighs> not really. Not unless you excel, not unless you keep studying, unless you press in. And you're going to, what you're going to have to do, you're going to have to really work hard. And hard work it's not a curse. Come on. It's the way we worship. Amen. The children of Israel knew that worship, work was a type of worship. Yes. Yes. Everything you do, do it as unto God. Woo. Yes. Whatever you think work is, y'all do it unto God. Amen. Amen. Don't do it unto, unto Charlie. <laughs> do it, and you may not like your boss. Those that work with me can't say that, I'm sure. But <clears throat> It doesn't make a difference if you like Who's leading you? You still serve. In the kingdom realm of God, it's servant leadership. Everybody in the body of Christ serves. Amen. We're not, none of us are there for our own agenda. The problem with a lot of church today is people have their own agendas about what they want to do. And if you want to figure it out, go back to 1 Corinthians 13 and look at the love chapter and find out as we walk in love how we're supposed to act. They take no, pay no attention to a suffered wrong. We're not, I'm not concerned with my own way. Come on. Well, that'll Come eliminate on. most people in church right there. God, God has plans for you to come into his kingdom. Now, Matthew 28. Everything we do, and the Lord's been speaking to me the last few weeks about giving more clarity about what we're called to do. What are we called to do? Make disciples of men. That wow. means men and women. Wow. How do you get discipled? And I, sometimes I say this, I'd rather you get discipled than get saved. What? The first step of discipleship is getting saved. Wow. Wow. Come on. The emphasis is on the wrong syllable. Most everybody's trying to get people saved and they don't know what to do with them when they get them saved. Oh, Never train them up to read the book. Never train them up to become who Jesus called us to be just like him. Oh, this is good. Good. The, uh, this is, I tell you this every Sunday, but I can't ever get it out of my crawl because when I read that, it blew me away. I was born and raised in the church. I don't remember a time that I didn't believe Jesus was, was God's son, that God raised him from the dead. I can kind of go back and look and see when he became Lord of my life, and it's still a daily dying to myself to let him be Lord. I have to continually, every morning I say, Jesus, you are Lord of my life. God, you are my God. Holy Spirit, you live in me and you guide me. I have to say that with my mouth to make sure it keys in my heart. He's Lord. He's Lord. But I grew up in the church. My grandparents on my daddy's side was Pentecostal holiness, apostolic church starter. He was one of the early part of Pentecostal Holy Church in Falcon, North Carolina. I didn't even know this stuff until in the 90s. But he got miraculously healed when he came to a, a meeting. And it must have, I don't know if it was at a Baptist church, Methodist church, but when the Holy Spirit fell on that, they kicked him out. And then they had these brush arbors. They'd go out and have some place to meet until they could finally raise the money to build a building. But that became, in North Carolina, the Pentecostal Holy Church in Indiana. It was Assemblies of God. And, and two or three other movements like that, like a Four Square Church. And there was, there was some spirit-filled movements of God that started in the early 1900s and the thing that tried to mess it up was religion. Come on. Them tongue talkers, them holy rollers. You know, when you start talking about tongue talkers, you better be careful because Jesus talked about us that these signs would follow believers they might, that we would speak in new tongues. We'd take up serpents, not snake handlings like them crazy white boys in the mountains would do handling snakes. Well, I never known a brother would ever chase a born to hold a snake. Anyway, they shall take up, so if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And believers will lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. But he said they would speak in tongues. That was my paternal grandfather. My, and my, on my mom's side was pilgrim holiness. They believed in holiness, they didn't believe in nothing else. 
They didn't dance. They didn't let the hair down. They didn't do. I mean, they didn't do nothing. My mom used to take us to movies when she when we had us because she never got to go to movies. Wow. Religious stuff. Now, so I grew up in the Methodist church, but there were things in the Methodist church I never knew until I got hungry for the Word of God. And you, if you're hungry, you'll be fed. Amen. You know, if you get hungry, you, you won't sit long before you're starting looking for something to eat. Come on, come on. You don't get hungry just saying, well, I'm not going to do with that. Now you'll get hungry. And when you get hungry for God, I mean, when you get hungry for God, you'll start eating. You'll find his word. We were faced with an impossible situation, and somebody told me there was a, if things were possible with God. And I said, well, I don't know about that. I, this sounds really good. But if this is true, I know I can get the word of God for myself because I was raised in the church. And I know that the word of God is true, and it came from God. It's in the air, and it's for life application every day. <clears throat> And I said, if this is true, if healing's for today, I can go to the Word of God and find it for myself. Amen. I was believing what they said, but I was stubborn enough to say, I'm not going to believe this unless I can prove it by the Word of God. That was 1994. I'm more convinced today than I was yesterday and the, the day before that, all the way back to 94. I became a student of the Word of God, particularly concerning healing, and probably more specifically, believe in God for His promises by faith. Hallelujah. And you know, and, you know, and this, this ain't me. Romans 4, 16 says, and I'll first quote the King James, therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed. Woo! That's a little blind to me. The Amplified says, therefore, inheriting the promise of God is the outcome of faith and depends entirely on faith. In other words, if you don't walk in faith, there are promises that God's given you that you'll do without. Let me say it this way. Just because God promised something to you doesn't mean it's going to come to pass. Come on, come on. Abraham believed God. And God counted it for him to righteousness. But you know, if Abraham had not gotten in line with God, God's promise for him having seed to become the Messiah would have fallen short. Wow. Abraham had to co-labor with him. We receive the promises of God by faith. Amen. The good news is we don't conjure up this faith as a gift from God. Right. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Thank you, Lord. You, you'll hear people say things like, well, great tests and trials will give you great faith. Nah, can't be true. That's not scriptural, first of all. And secondly, I've known too many people going through great tests and trials. They end up, well, you hear about too many people. They jump out of windows because they lose all their income. Well, I thought that grit test and trials would give you faith. Not for them. They jumped out of a window. No, I, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I, no, I, and, these, and these almost 30 years, I've not found any other way faith comes other than the Word of God. Wow. <clears throat> And it's a gift that God gives you. Remember when Jesus spoke to the fig tree and they came by the next day and Peter said, look at that tree, you cursed What's up with that? And Jesus goes, have the faith of God. Have it. He extended to you and me a gift. Wow. You can take it or leave it. Have the faith of God. Then he said, whoever receives this faith and believes in his heart and confesses with his mouth in faith and believes that what he says by faith will come to pass, he'll have what he said. Therefore, I say unto you, what things, whoever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Wow. You pray and you shall have. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. That was not a percentage. That was a guaranteed prayer. Come on. And there's a guaranteed declaration. And this is how the body of Christ is called to walk. Four places, the Bible tells us, the just or the righteous of God. And by the way, you and I as believers are the righteousness of God in Christ. Not the righteousness of Jesus, which has been good. Not the righteousness of Paul, Peter, James, and John, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Elijah, Elisha, or any other prophets, or any other great men and women of God who lived prior to that. We have the faith of God himself. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> that beca Christ, Jesus became sin for us who knew no sin, that you and I would become the righteousness of God in Christ. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. It's beyond our comprehension. And he gives us a peace, like Pastor Sherry said, 
behind understanding. Wow. Wow. We, we can't fully understand this peace that we already have. I'll tell you something else. Everything that you need, everything that you would want is from heaven. And Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians, verse 3, chapter 1, everything that heaven contains has been lavished upon us as a love gift. Not going to be already lavished upon us as a love gift from his wonderful heavenly Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, all because he sees us wrapped in Christ. Do you think Jesus prays in faith? Yes. Oh, yeah. Do you think the Holy Spirit prays in faith? Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. And Romans, go read it. Romans 8 tells you that the Holy Spirit's praying for us and Jesus. Is praying. We're sandwiched in between these two where Jesus is praying for us and the Holy Spirit's praying for us in faith. That means when they pray, nothing can stop it from coming to pass except you and me. I don't care if you just got saved this morning. On, you have an inheritance on. beyond your comprehension. Wow. You're not waiting on getting it. I'll tell you another one. <clears throat> because my bent's always in healing, but really understanding how to operate in the promises of God through faith. Bringing an expectation of good to those who don't expect any good in their life. Wow. You, you may be sitting here, and, and that's what Pastor Sherry was talking about this morning. You, you may have had a bad day. <laughs> Shouldn't make any difference to us. We know the story. We know the truth. We know the victory we have. We always are caused to triumph in Christ. Thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Always causes us to triumph. We always win unless we quit. I don't know if you played football. Maybe you girls didn't, but or whatever. If your coach ever told you, you if you don't quit, you'll win. But if you, but in winners don't quit. Quitters, on, quitters never win, and, and winners never quit. Come on, come on. You have an inheritance from God that's sitting. It's inside you. If you're born again, if you're not born again, you have an opportunity before we leave today. Because I want you to know, I want you to come into this kingdom. Yes. Now go back to this, Matthew 28. This is my favorite one. It used to be Mark's. I like them all, actually. But in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and in Acts, there's great commissions. It's what Jesus told his disciples before he left. <clears throat> now, I don't know about you, last minute instructions are usually the most important ones. You can take all the other stuff and sort of decipher it, but if he gives you something right before he, like, I'm, boys, I'm out of here, but let me tell you something. Great commission. Now, listen to it. Whew, he's gone. They just are looking at him. And the angel says, what y'all looking at? This same Jesus, do you know he's the same yesterday and today and forever? Amen. And Amen. one of our banners over here says, as he is, so are we in this world. Hallelujah. Not as he was. And if, see, if he said as he was while he was on this earth, so are you. And I said, man, glory to God. And Jesus said that if we believed on him, the works that he did, we would do. And he just talked about miracles, signs, and wonders. He said, from now on, you've known, he told his disciples, I won't go in the whole chapter 14, but he said, from now on, you've known the Father and you've, and you've heard from him. And Philip said, Lord, just show us the Father, we'll be satisfied. He goes, Philip, how long have I been with you? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe, and this is the key, I'm living in the Father and the Father is living in me? The words are not, I speak to you, not my own, but they come from the Father who dwells in me, who miracles, signs, and wonders he does through me. Yes. Don't you believe that I'm in him right, and he's in me? Yes. And then the next verse radically changed my life. Come on, come on. And I can't stop until I see it begin to manifest. And if you believe on me, these miracles and signs and wonders I just said that I did, you'll do. And greater works than these because I'm going to be my Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Wow. People go, well, I prayed and God didn't do nothing. <laughs> and now, in fact, most of what you're praying for, he's already done. Come on, come in on. fact, when you ask for something you've already been given, you, you're asking out of faith. You're asking for a promise that you've been given out of faith, so it ain't going to come to pass. 
until you believe that what he said is true. It, it all boils down to one thing, which is the very first thing that got us in trouble. And when the devil came to Eve, he says, and by the way, Adam is right there. Did God say, don't eat of this tree? She says, oh, yeah. Now, she's got, got religious pretty quick. Oh, yeah, we're not supposed to eat this tree or touch it. The day we do, we'll die. And that was true, except for the fact she's supposed to touch it. That's right. That's right. Did God say, don't eat of this tree? She said, yes. He goes, you. He says, you will not die. I'll tell you, you will walk out of here, and the devil will come up and tell you, maybe not with, a verb, with an audible voice, but tell you, nah, that stuff ain't true. You know how to find out. Come on. Come on. Go put your nose in this book. Don't take my word for it. And by the way, I ain't got a word to give you outside of God's words any worth five cents. <clears throat> and this is good preaching. You know why? Because it ain't mine. That's one, one preacher here in got town because he's plagiarizing sermons. I'll tell you right here online for the whole world, I'm going to plagiarize everything Jesus said and tell you he said it, but I'm going to tell you what he said. I don't have any sermons on my own. All I got is what he's got. And again, don't take my word for it. Stick your nose in this book. If you, and if you don't have a Bible, take one with you. We, in one Bible study one time, somebody said, man, we can't afford I can't take that big Bible with me. I got my book bag. Man, put that book bag away. It ain't going to get, get you nothing. <clears throat> you need the Word of God. It ar- it's beyond what you think. And it's not religious. Jesus is not religious. In fact, the thing that made him mad and had him turn things over and, and, and call people vipers and snakes was religious mess that kept people from the truth. You need the truth because that's the only thing that'll make you free. <clears throat> the only thing that'll make you free is the truth. Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, you'll know that I am and do nothing of myself, but the Father that dwells in me does the works. And then he told his disciples, if you continue in my word, you'd be my disciples indeed, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Hallelujah. And he came proclaiming truth. Yes, sir. For what reason? Yes, sir. To set the captives free. Hallelujah. Now I'm going to go here again, and then we're going to go to Isaiah 61. <clears throat> and one thing that Pastor Sherry told me this week about camels. She had a dream about camels and about quail. Can I share it? She said, I was in this dream with her, and she, she some, I don't know how it went, but you had two eggs, and they were quail eggs, and when she went, you want to show them to me? Is that right? You're going to give them to me to eat. And when she gave it to me, one of them, the quail eggs opened, it was a bird, he came out. And then while she's looking, looked out the door, and there's this big animal beast outside. She said, what is that? It's a camel. <clears throat> In Isaiah 60, it says, rise and shine for your lights come. That's the first thing Pastor Hash, Bishop Hash told me. Once we started this church in 2011, he woke up one morning. He, he called me early. He says, I just, the Lord's been dealing with me about you and what, this church and this, what you're doing. He said, Isaiah 60 is yours. Arise and shine because your light has already come. And the glory of the Lord will be shown around about you. There's darkness in the world. Deep darkness covers the people, but let your light shine Hallelujah. towards them. <clears throat> the world, in case you hadn't noticed, the world's getting darker. And we're being shoved lies down our throat that aren't true. We know they're not true because they don't line up with God's word. Come on, come on. Our reaction is not to go riot. Our light is to let our light shine. <laughs> if, you, if you let your light shine like Jesus did, he loved those he ministered to. Amen. The only ones he was upset with were the ones that most people didn't see it would keep people in bondage because they didn't know the truth or teach the truth. <clears throat> and I'll give you an example of that. The Pharisees and Sadducees, all the religious leaders of Jesus' day, and even when you go back and look at these gospels, it says the, the discussion, the talk about the Messiah returning was, was rampant everywhere in Jesus' day. It wasn't like he showed up like, is this? They've been talking about the Messiah coming back. They hadn't heard from anybody in about 400 years. Isaiah had been 700 years. <clears throat> but they were all concerned 
and thinking and believing. And these guys had gone through all their training based on what was coming for their lifetime, the Messiah. And the Messiah shows up and standing in their midst and sometimes two or three feet in front of them and they don't even recognize them because of their misinterpretation of the truth of the Word of God. Or their failure to be able to hear from God when he says what he says. Don't make that mistake. God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are not into religion. And when people say, what religion are you? I say, I ain't got one. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm a disciple of Christ. And I've come to tell his story everywhere I go. And that's not just me. That's you. Well, you're a preacher. Well, so are you. I don't know exactly what he's called you to. But he didn't call you to sit there and not do nothing. We didn't, you didn't get saved so you could go to church. You got saved to be the church. Oh, hallelujah. <clears throat> to be the church. Oh, that's good. And if everything we do, every outreach we do, every block we go visit, every Bible study, if everything we do, if our heart's goal is not to make disciples of men and women, we've missed God. Come on. <clears throat> it's the only thing we're here for. You got saved to go save others. Jesus says, all authority. He had shown himself alive for 40 days. This is the last day they saw him. Matthew tells it, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts. Both of them tell about this moment. The last minute he got, there were different interpretations of what he said. And I'll guarantee you, each one of those in those five locations don't contain everything he said. Contain parts of it. But the Holy Spirit made sure we had everything we needed in the, in the, in the culmination of it all. <clears throat> and in the leading and the teaching of the Holy Spirit that would teach you and I about Jesus. Hallelujah. He said, all authority, Matthew 20, all authority, all authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and the seen and the unseen realm has been given to me. Now you go in my authority and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to faithfully Follow every command I've given you. Woo! Come on. Come on. I've read that for 29 years. I think it was early this year or in the last year when all of a sudden I saw, my goodness, everything he told the disciples to do is my command. Amen. Is your command. Yes. When he tells them to go places and do something, that's your command. Amen. That's my command. You have to be led by his command and his Holy Spirit. Paul says, I'm going towards India. Holy Spirit, not go this way. Well, you said going to all the world. Well, each of us are going to all the world, but we're going to go where he calls us to go. Amen. Amen. You have, and don't get your eyes on some preacher or some ministry and say, I want to be like them exactly because God's going to call you to his. They may be similar, maybe different outreaches, but still you're going to have your own specific calling. Why in the world are we here? What are we born again for? To make disciples. Come on, come on. If you go get people saved and sit them down, you stop the growth. If you go bring people to salvation through Jesus Christ and then disciple them, you've raised up another discipler. Multiplication is astronomical. Wow, wow, wonderful. Megaphone. Megaphone. Everybody that gets born again, becomes like Jesus and does the works he did and, and goes out and tells the gospel and release. There's some people who are going to reject it. But the body of Christ could rapidly reach this and they're working at it. There's a remnant. Not all of them are doing this. Some of them are into just how big's our roster. They won't even tell you to tithe. They're afraid if you tell them to tithe. I mean, if people, people got rich people in their church. Don't talk about tithing. Because for some people, that's a ton of money. And they say, well, he just wants me to tithe so I can put it in his church. Well, first of all, it ain't his church. This ain't my church. This is his oh. church. Oh. Jesus is the head and the source of everything. Everything finds its essence. In, this is Ephesians 1, prayer. Everything now finds its essence in him. And he alone is the head and the source of everything needed 
in the church and we are his body on the earth. The fullness of him that fills all in all and goes in, in with his presence flowing through us. That's kind of a mix between King James and the Passion Translation. But God wants to move into your life and through you to reach the world. Make disciples of all nations, teaching them to faithfully follow every, every command I've given you. In this, this message today is for what are we here for? What, what's our part in this? It's generally specific to the body of Christ, but then there's some generally specifics he's called us to do. Amen. Amen. And we're going to do it. Yes, we are. And we're going to fight through it. Woo. I was listening to Brother Hagin this week, and he was telling a story about this, and I said, I'm so glad he said that because now I can tell you, I think I've told you before anyway. He says, everybody thinks everything's just hunky-dory. He said, you know how many times I walked up on the stage to preach? And I wish if they'd asked me what I felt, and I said, I want everyone to pray for me. He said, but I didn't go by my feelings. I go by what the Word of God says. You know how many times I've stepped up here and said, man, (laughs) I don't feel like I got nothing to give. That's my feelings. They're not based on truth. They're based on my flesh realm perceptive. God's spirit speaks to my spirit. This world speaks to my flesh. Which one am I listening to? If you assess your future based on what you've got, you're only assessing it based on this world system and not the kingdom. You've shut the kingdom around God out. If you go, well, my goodness, I ain't nothing ever worked out for me. Nothing ever's going to work out for me. Well, you're just going by what you've got. You're just going by your inventory and then making some type of prophetic thing about your life based on what you've got. Jesus never did that. They said, well, how, what have we got here? We ain't got but five loaves and two fishes. He goes, well, go ahead and feed them. No. Jesus, don't you, don't you just hear what we said? If, if what God's called you to is based on what you got in your pocket, you'll never go anywhere. What God's called us to is probably 20 to $30 million plus. And I, can I tell you something? It ain't in here. I ain't got it. I ain't got to get it. God will raise it up. Amen. If, he, if he's called us to do it, we'll go do it. Come on, baby, chase it after us. Come on, baby. Come on. If he calls you, he'll supply it. Amen. If we steward it, if we trust him, Amen. if we believe him. Why? For a purpose. 1140. Oh, man. We got plenty of time to preach. If, if you get finished before, before I do, you can go ahead and go. Amen. <laughs> Isaiah 60. No, I'm going to go into Isaiah 61. Jesus read this in the fourth chapter of Luke. Actually, he didn't read it, read it in the book of Luke. He was in the synagogue, but Luke recorded it. What we have now is Luke, the fourth chapter. He stood up to read as was his custom. It wasn't the first time he did this. It was his custom. He read from the book of Isaiah. He had the spirit, and he's reading out loud. They brought him a scripture. The spirit of the Lord God's upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Amen. I had one of, these, one of these local apologists call me up one day saying, Brother, now when I look on your website and I see that you support this man and that one, he said, I, I got to ask you this question. Do you believe in that prosperity message? I'm like, oh, man. Why you want to ask me that like that? Basically, what you're doing is wanting to pick a fight because you're saying that you don't believe in that. Do you believe that? I said, let me tell you something. If we talk about, we preach the hope of the gospel, right? The hope means a joyful, intense expectation of good. In the gospel, we expect good to come from it. It's called good news. And Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord of God is upon me because he's anointed me to, number one, preach the gospel to the poor. What is good news to the poor? You don't have to be poor. Don't think it's your lot in life. And you go, well, Brother Noah, you don't know what that's like to be poor. Oh, really? <laughs> My dad was raised a preacher's kid. He, a, a whole, he was number eight of ten kids. They had to, as long as, when they got old enough to paint and wallpaper, they had to go to work. I don't care if you were six, eight, nine, whatever. The first five kids got mad at the parents for having more kids. They said, you can't take care of us. Why you keep having kids? One day my father was rolling up a cigarette, thumbing somewhere, he said, and the car came by and blew the tobacco out. He says, that's it. I'm so sick of being poor. I ain't walking around with that money in my, in my pocket no more. Come on. 
some point in time, you have to get fed up with how you've been living and say, I'm going to do something different. But know this, you can't do it by yourself. <clears throat> I said, let me tell you something. This guy asked me these questions. If, if God doesn't care about our prosperity, what would you tell the folks in the street, the homeless folks in the street, what would you tell the people that are down and out can't get nowhere? First thing Jesus said, God anointed him to, to preach to them and give them hope for change. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, recover the sight of the blind, and set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, the day when the free favors of God profusely abound. He closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he, and he began to say to them, he didn't finish, this day this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. <clears throat> it has not been unfulfilled. Let me read you the, the rest of this. Now understand, this is the anointing that was on Jesus, the head of the church for his ministry. He's the head. We're the body. We ain't worth the lick without him. Come on, come on. He's the head. We're the body. He's seated at the right hand of God. He's finished. He's sitting down. Who's left to do the work? You and me, the body of Christ. Let me just say this. The body of Christ is not the people that show up to church. It's the people who are born again that show up and get involved and they obey what God calls them to do. <clears throat> Just because you go to church don't make you a Christian any more than me going in there bossy bullets makes me a chicken sandwich. Oh, Amen. <laughs> I was talking to Pastor Sherry earlier this week about the church. I came in this morning and said, let me just make sure I make myself clear. Our church is not just a Sunday morning service. It's all that we do as a body, Amen. as a body of believers. Amen. On Wednesday night, we pray. Sometimes we say, if you're born again, come join us in prayer. Amen. If you're not going to be born again, get born again and come join us in prayer. But don't come here with unbelief because you're not a believer and come pray because you didn't know how to pray. That's right. Wow, wow. The early church was the gathering of believers. It was not evangelistic in itself. It was a gathering like this to edify ourselves and work one, one by one with each other and move together in unity in the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. Amen. The church today, some of them don't even ask you if you ever want to get saved. That ain't the kind of church we are. Come on, come on. We're a church, a body of believers who take God and his word seriously. Yeah. If Jesus said we're supposed to do his works, well, bless God, I don't really care what other people think. I'm going to do what he said. Amen. I'm not going to act like I'm better than them. I'm going to do what Jesus said, and I'm going to walk in love. Because Jesus said, they don't know that you belong to me because you love one another. Even if they mean and mean and ugly to you, you still got to walk in love. Amen. Even Amen. if you don't believe with the lifestyle of those that you reach out to, you better walk in love. Because Jesus walked in love and compassion. <clears throat> and faith worketh by love. If Jesus did not walk in love, his faith would not have worked. Everything he did, everything God did was motivated by his love. Oh, For God oh. so loved so good. that he gave. Do you think you can come do this in the church and not walk in love? You're out of your mind. Woo. When people are getting skirmishes in the church and they backbite and talk, that's from the devil. Come on, come on. You can just look at one another and see who's walking with God because how they walk in love. Mm. And you know that you get some places in church, you got them mean people in there. <laughs> they better get a hold of themselves because they're not walking in love. And if you don't walk in love, your faith will not work. And people say, well, I don't know why this stuff, if my faith stuff ain't working. You better check out your, your love walk. And you also better know, which is part of your love walk, have you forgiven somebody? Because oh, as Jesus said, when Jesus said in, in Mark 11 about the fig tree, if you speak to that and believe what you say, come to pass, if you pray like this and believe it, you receive it when you pray. You'll have what you say. You'll pr have what you pray. And then he said, and if you, when you stand, pray and forgive. So your Father in heaven will forgive you. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father forgive you. Guess what? If you're walking in unforgiveness, you might as well play tiddly wings because your faith ain't going to do nothing. Oh, come on. Preach it. It's a good word. And faith is a substance of things that we expect 
to come to pass. Wow. If you're praying in faith, but you're wondering if it's going to work, you might as well not pray. Praying in faith is a type of prayer that believes that when you pray, God's going to answer me. Who do you think you are to think God's going to do that? I'm his child that believes what he says. Oh, thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> I've said this before, I'll say it again. Jesus never once doubted anything God told him to do. He knew that when he did what God said, God was going to do what he said. Period. In the story. He trusted God. Oh, come on. And when he did what God said, he didn't have to understand what, how God was going to do how God was going to do it. I don't, I'm not so sure that when that, that man who, when Jesus came to blind men, came to him blind from birth, and Jesus spit on the ground mud, put it on his eyes, and they go wash and pull us out on When that guy left and got healed, he went to God and says, I'm always amazed at what you tell me to do. It wasn't, that wasn't written before he got there. Unless God said, one day you're going to do this, why well, I tell you, then do it. He says, I only do what I see my father do. I only say what I hear my father say. I only go where my father tells me to go. Wow, wow. Do you know that Jesus was the most yielded person that's ever walked this earth? Amen. Totally, 100% yielded to the father. Full of faith that whatever God said to do, he knew that he would do it. Amen. And he told us to be like him. Oh. <sighs> Anytime you want to say, man, you're trying to act like Jesus. Go back to John 14, 12. He said, if I believe him, I'd do what he did. Come on, come on. That really has nothing to do with me except for the fact I yield mm. to him. Amen. I can't take any glory in anything. <laughs> Some big preacher, well, some big, big preacher. They want but one big preacher, and we're trying to be like him. So that message that was given to Jesus about being anointed to go change is the same thing he told us to do. And I'm going to pray. And just John, John 14, 12, if you believe on me, the works I do, you'll do greater works. And he goes, and I'm going to, this is a prayer of faith, and I'm going to pray, and God's going to give you another comfort. Don't you have to ask him? Not if he told him. I'm going to pray, and God's going to give. You know, if we pray like that, on things God's told us specifically, we'll see more things happen in the Word of, in the Word of God Amen. come to pass. Amen. I'm going to pray, and the Father's going to give you another comfort, the Holy Spirit of God, to remain with you ever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot see because they don't believe, they don't, because they can't see him and know him. But you know him because he's been with you, but he shall be in you. Oh, the same Holy Spirit that indwelled Jesus, Jesus said, I'm going to give them to you. Now you go wait in Jerusalem for the promise I've told you about. The promise of the Father, which is cross reverence in your new King James, John 14, 16. I'm going to pray and God's going to give you. Not when you get to heaven, but when you pray. Oh, thank you, Jesus. If we would just believe what he said, oh. we'd change the world. Believe, believe. In union, and co-laboring with him. Amen. He told us to be like him. Yes. Well, if we're going to be like him, well, let me go back to one more scripture. First chapter of John. Here, John the Baptist, baptizing people. All of a sudden, here comes Jesus. Somebody asked, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the earth. They didn't hear that just then. God had spoken that to somebody before. And when he came down the water, John goes, uh, why don't you baptize me? I'm baptizing with water, but you're going to baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. I don't want it. I want what you've got to give. Amen. Now, where did that come from? Jesus said, John, let's just do what God said. Come on. Yeah, but that seemed like a good thing. Yeah, I know, John. Let's just do what God said. You know, if we could just stop and every once in a while and go, let's just do what God said, it wouldn't be a good thing, right? I mean, you start to get in a quarrel with somebody, just hold it, hold it. God told me to walk in love. I can't do this. Come on. Do you know you, have, you don't have to keep the Ten Commandments anymore? You've only got two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind. I heard this this week, Brother Hagin said, we don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. Keep the two. If you keep those two, you'll keep them all. We have two things to do. Love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love our fellow men as I said. If I love my fellow man as myself, I ain't going to steal from him. I ain't going to covet what he's got. I'm not going to take his wife. I'm not going to try to kill him, murder him. Come on. Why? Because I'm walking how the kingdom operates. Oh, walking in love. I said this before. 
God's got authority over everything. In Jesus. I'm glad he's good. Because there's a darkness out there trying to overtake this world. And it's evil. But they ain't going to win. And if I die declaring that, in front of that evil world, so be it. But I'm going to declare the truth that God is good and his mercy endures forever. Grace and mercy. And his grace is everlasting. His mercy endures forever and his grace. I heard that this morning for you guys. His mercy endures forever and his grace is never ending. So we're called to be like him. Listen to this. And this is what we'll get to today. Ticking down. This is from the Passion Translation, so I may stumble. The mighty spirit of the Lord Yahweh is wrapped around me because Yahweh has anointed me as a messenger to preach good news to the poor. Hallelujah. If you're in here and you're poor or you're watching online or whenever and you're poor, I got good news for you. You don't have to be poor. And if that's the prosperity message of the kingdom, Yes, bless God, I believe it. Yes, hallelujah. Does he want me to be rich so I can have a Maserati? I don't think he cares what kind of car we drive. Does it have me or do I have it? I know he doesn't want me to be covetous. I, I'm happy with whatever I drive. I, I, does he want us to be delivered from poverty? God anointed Jesus in his church to declare the truth so you be free. Amen. He has sent me to heal the wounds of the brokenhearted, to tell captives, you are free. There's, there's captivity out there. People can't figure out what they are. They're held captive to spirit denomination, demonization, things, sexual activities they get caught up in. They, they need to be set free, not cursed, not chastised, not hated. Take the good news to them. Amen. Some people are going to say, I don't want what you got. Just wipe my feet. Keep going on. Come on. Yeah, Jesus let people walk away. One man came to him and said, Jesus, what am I going to do to inherit eternal life? He says, keep the law. I've done that since my youth. He's going to say something he heard from the Father. No other way he could get it. There's one thing you lack. Because Jesus didn't know everything because he was God. He was a man anointed by God. He was God in the flesh. Don't get me wrong. But he didn't live as God. Because if he lived as God, I can't do what he did. There ain't no way I can do it. But if what he did, he did as God, then I can do it if I did it the way he did it. There's one thing you lack. Go sell everything you got. Give it to the poor. Follow me. The man walked away. Jesus went, bye. You don't force people in the kingdom. You tell the truth and say, they get a choice. We weren't forced in. I got nine things going. I got to pull back in. He sent me to heal the wounds of the broken heart and to tell captives you are free and to tell prisoners be free from your darkness. I'm sent to announce a new season of Yahweh's grace and a time of God's recompense on his enemies to comfort all who are in sorrow, to strengthen. This is our job. Amen. To strengthen. Let me find my place. To strengthen those crushed by despair who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful bouquet and place of ashes, the oil of bliss instead of tears, the mantle of joyous praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. Because of this, they will be known. Who is that? Those that hear the truth. Those that are benefits of the anointing of God on his head and his body in the church. Jesus and the church. Because of this, they will be known who? Those that were born down, that were poor, that were brokenhearted, that were held captive, those that were in tears, those that mourned. They will become mighty oaks of righteousness planted by Yahweh as a living display of his glory. Woo. That's the fullness that will confine the wise, won't it? Because of this, they will be known as mighty oaks of righteousness planted by Yahweh as a living display of his glory. They will restore ruins from long ago and rebuild what was long devastated. They will renew ruined cities and desolations of past generations. Foreigners will be appointed to, be, uh, to shepherd your many flocks and strangers will captivate your fields and tend your vines. Wow. 
but you will be known as a priest of Yahweh, wow. called servants of God. Every one of us came from that same place into the body of Christ to be known as trees of righteousness planted by God to give him glory. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. People say, well, you were rich before you got there. If you compare any human riches to God's riches, it looks like the worst poverty you could possibly be in. I come into a kingdom where my father, he owns everything. Hallelujah. What we think is, is, humanity, is, is citizens or of this earth, what riches are, we don't have a clue. It's based on how we assume it from our situation or our standpoint. But you come into the kingdom where there is no lack. When you get to heaven, there's no, there's no, there's no loans, there's no banks, there's no ATM machines, there's no credit checks. <laughs> We're heirs, heirs of God. Oh, hallelujah. And join heirs with Jesus Christ. Wow, wow, that's so good. And just in case you didn't know, he said, all of us have been given to me. And we're joint heirs with him. Ha. Oh, I can't be rich. He's rich. We will feast on the wealth of the nations and vessels and the uh, riches, and, and excuse me, and reveal on the riches because you received a double case of shame and dishonor. You will inherit a double portion of kindness, joy, and everlasting bliss. For I, Yahweh, love fairness and justice. I hate stealing and sin. I will rightly repay them because of my faithfulness and uh, enter into an everlasting covenant with them. Their seed will be famous among the nations and their descendants, the center of the tension of the people and all who see them will recognize that they are the seed of Yahweh has blessed with favor. Thank you, Jesus. I don't, you just miss what your inheritance is. But we are called to take the truth as disciples, anointed with the power and the authority, not only the authority, but also the dunamis, miracle-working power to go share the gospel in love and kindness to change the world. That's why we go to a doctor. That's why we go into the streets on Friday night. That's why we do all that we do, and that's not the end of all, is to bring them into this kingdom. So they become, they become. Don't be careful how you look and judge. Because the one you look at in disdain may just be and has been called to be that tree of righteousness planted by God to give him glory to renew the wasted cities and rebuild the walls. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Make disciples of men. Raise them up to be who God's called them to be. Amen. I'm preaching better than you're shouting. That's our calling. That's what God wants us to do. That's what he's calling. Every born again believer is called to do this. Let me finish that one story then and then we'll go pray for, we're going to curse cancer before we go. John the Baptist was there baptizing the water when Jesus came. He said, no, baptize me. He said, no, John, let's do what God said. <clears throat> so John took him and we're going to talk about this on baptism. Because too many times we take people underwater and bring them back, send them back on the earth, and now you're back where you were. No, no, no. When we're dead and buried, and when we come up out of that water, we're raised together in heavenly places in Christ, seated in Christ's right hand. If you're not careful, you'll see water baptism just dunking you and putting you back on the dirt. And instead of seeing that's an outward sign in the natural realm was taking place in the spiritual realm that when the same power that God used when he raised Christ from the dead was raised us up together and made him sit together in heavenly places in oh, Christ. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> thank you, Lord. When Jesus came out of the water, he brought him up and John looked up and the spirit of God descended upon him. It, like a dove, it, just, it wasn't a dove, but like a dove. And John goes, this is the one. This is the one. This is the one that God told me about when he called me into ministry. God personally called John into ministry and told him, one day you'll baptize a man and when you raise him up, you'll see the God, the spirit of God descend upon him and remain. That's the one that's gonna baptize humanity 
with the Holy Ghost and fire. That's why John kept going around saying, I baptize in water, but there's one coming after me. I'm shoes. I'm not even worthy to untie. I baptize you in water, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Hallelujah. And he wanted it for himself. Amen. Bless God, I do too. He's giving it to us. Amen. 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 Jesus told us to be like him. Told us to, he, I didn't get to this part. When he commissioned in, in Luke 10 and Matthew 10, he said, go, priest, tell them that your, God's kingdom peace has come upon you. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils and cleanse lepers. Freely have you received, freely give. Hallelujah. And in Luke 13, when Jesus cast the devil on that man, they said, you cast out the devils by the devil. He said, no, nah, if I cast out the devil by the devil, I'm a divided house. No, no, no. Understand this, that when I cast the devil on that man, God's kingdom realm has come near to you. Whoa, hallelujah. The body of Christ should usher in the kingdom realm of God every where we go and radically transform the natural realm by the supernatural realm. And Jesus said this, what you just seen was a kingdom realm coming next to you. Satan stands guard over his fortress kingdom is loaded with an arsenal to use when he wants until someone stronger than him comes and binds him, ties him up, and then he takes the spoils. He just said, I bound Satan and took the spoils. And then he goes, this is a war. This is the Passion Translation. And whoever's not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather the spoils with me, and his circumstance of getting the spoils is cast on the devil as men. Whoever doesn't gather the spoils with me shall be scattered. Before you put your mouth against healing and deliverance, I'd be careful that you don't separate yourself from Jesus. Come on. Because he told us to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, and cleanse them. No, that's what he told the disciples. Let me tell you one more time, Matthew 28. Go make disciples of all nations, teaching them to faithfully follow every, every command I've given you. And in fact, this last one too, go make disciples. Come on, come on. Our bottom line is this, make disciples and teach them to faithfully follow Jesus, everything he did. So we cursed cancer. Cancer took my daddy. I didn't know he had to deal with it. Took my brother about three or four years ago, and I'm fed up with it. And when I spoke at my brother's funeral, the Lord said, or led me, every time you close, curse cancer. So we're going to do it. Cancer, oh. cancer is, a, is a wicked thing. I, I know so many people fighting right now, and their names are on my list. And I don't have to be right there beside them because Jesus spoke, and, and the centurion's son was healed. That yeah, was Jesus. That's my big brother. He told me to be like him. So if you have cancer in your body or you know someone that has cancer or someone in your family has cancer, I want you to stand to your feet. We're going to specifically speak to the cancer in their body. If you have cancer in your body, someone in your family or somebody you know, stand up. Together, I will speak the words, but we're going to curse the cancer in their body. Amen. You got scripture for that? Yeah, Jesus spoke to a fig tree, spoke to the wind, spoke to the waves, spoke to a fever. He told demons, get out. That's our example. Amen. <laughs> We're called to be like him. I don't understand that, Brother Noble. Well, get this tape and listen to it again. Or go back and find all you can. But you got to know that we're supposed to be like him. Amen. Amen. So if you have cancer, we're going to speak. When I tell you to, call your name or their name out. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be well balanced and always alert because your enemy, the devil, roams about incessantly like a roaring lion looking for his prey to devour. Take a decisive stand against him. The Word of God tells us to take a divisive, decisive stand against Satan and his Come kingdom on. and against him and resist his every attack with strong, vigorous faith. For you know that you're, all your believing brothers and sisters in the world are experiencing the same kind of troubles that you endure. When you come into the kingdom, your troubles aren't going to fly away. Come on. In fact, they may magnify but you are some just increase beyond your comprehension. So in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, let me back up one thing. Jesus, when the disciples returned back and said, man, Jesus, we were casting the devil out. We were healing the sick, man. We just tore it. He said, you know, that's really great. You know, it's better than that. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Oh, hallelujah. 
That's the true source of your authority. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. To such a point in faith that God's, everybody's name is in that book. Revelation says that your name not, not be blotted out. Because he died for all humanity. Oh, thank you, Jesus. To the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, because our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life which is a true source of our authority, we speak and curse cancer in the physical bodies of the people's names that we call out right now. And you call that name out. Mary, Terry, Jill, Marty, Taylor, Allie, Amy, Carolyn, Adora, RM, Betsy, Miss Davis, Nina, Susan, Gina, Phil, Olivia, Lee, Tony, Marcia, Thomas, and Bob. Cancer in these bodies, we're speaking directly to you and we command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to die. If you're watching by line, your name, I'm talking to you too. I speak to every cancer cell in these bodies. We command you to cease and desist your maneuvers now and come out of these bodies. Sometimes cancer is not necessarily physiological. It may be demonic, what Jesus told us to cast out devils. So in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you foul unclean spirits of cancer. We command you, loose them, let them go and come out of the bodies now in Jesus' name. Furthermore, if there's any cancer in our bodies that we don't even know is there, unknown, undetected, we don't have to wait to get big enough to have, be able to be visibly see it. We speak to every cancer cell in the sound of our, and within the sound of my ear in our bodies. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command every cancer cell to die, and if it's demonic, come out, loose them, let them be. Any other sickness, any other disease, any other torment, anything that you're going through, we speak the peace of God over you from the top of your head to the bottoms of your feet. We command that every cell of your body function in the perfection that God created to function. We speak against and, and crush any addiction, any kind of sexual perversion addiction, any kind of uh, bondages, any kind of mental issues, any kind of physical issues, any kind of cerebral issues, any kind of depression, oppression, anything that's keeping us from being everything that God's caused to be. We command it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to leave. We speak healing from the top of your head to the bottoms of your feet in this place now and forevermore in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to lead you in one more prayer. Actually, one prayer with two things we're going to ask him for. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then are you saved? We have to yield. Say, Jesus, you're Lord of all. And we believe that God raised him from the dead. I'm going to lead you in that prayer. As many times I said, Jesus, Lord, but it didn't make, I didn't say it from my heart. And Jesus said one time in Luke 6, what good does it do you to call me Lord if you don't put into practice what I teach? Come on, come on. Uh, your justification is not doing what he teaches. Your justification because he's Lord. Because he's Lord, you follow him. I don't have to tell you to change your ways. Follow Jesus come and do what he said. On. If you're doing something that wants you to do, going to say, stop doing that. He'll go. You go, okay, Lord, amen, all right? Yeah. I'm gonna lead you in that prayer. He also said, if you ask him, he'll give you the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. If we, Luke 11, if we who are evil know God how to give good gifts to our kids, how much more would the Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Oh, wow. right. if, you've, if you've never been born again, if you've never been filled with his Holy Spirit, today's a day, amen? Yeah. It's yours for the asking, his for the giving, yours for the receiving, amen? Repeat this after me, Heavenly Father, Let's do that again. If you're, if you're born again, you can say this again, you know. All right? Heavenly Father, today I confess Jesus is Lord of my life. I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. And according to your word and my profession of faith, I'm now saved. Now take my life, God, and do something with it. You also, said you also said that if I ask, that if I ask you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. So I ask, now, I ask you now, fill me fill to overflowing, overflowing in Jesus' name. Jesus name. Amen, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Now, we got, a, we got a couple books here. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, or maybe you rededicated your life to the Lord, or maybe you prayed to receive his Holy Spirit, we've got a couple books for you, Jamie or... Kelly, if y'all would, if anybody wants one, just come up right here after the service and we'll give you one. Amen. Amen. We want you to have everything you need to be successful. Stand to your feet. Amen. 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 Is Victor, are you still here?
Can I, would you come up here a second? Would that be all right? I want to introduce you to somebody. You're going to find out this week anyway. Come on up here. God bless you. This is Victor Nicholson. He's our new executive director of the Dream Center. He's going to join us week after next. But he wanted to come visit us this morning. You caught me by surprise. I didn't know you were coming. Yeah. Well, God I bless you. I the church, and the Lord said, come here. So. Well, God bless you. Thank yes, you, sir. Victor. Thank you. I'll lay hands on you one Please. Sunday soon. Okay. Well, I'll do it today. Is there any oil anywhere? We got some oil? Okay. Oh, yeah, we do. Brother Tommy Tyson, who was one of my mentors, was a Methodist preacher, First Methodist Church in Durham, North Carolina, and God filled him with the Holy Spirit, and they kicked him out. And um, he said, well, can I be the Methodist evangelist? He said, well, well Tommy, there's no pension, there's no pay there. He said, um, yeah, but hands are laid on me here. Every position we have, we usually do, a, if I've missed it, I don't mean to, but I usually try to anoint them and call them into the kingdom. So in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Victor, we receive you on our team as the executive director of a dream center. And by the blood of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I call you into your next step and your next phase in your life as you come to change the world around you for Jesus' sake to raise up disciples of men and women and to equip them to be everything as God called them to be and equip them to be disciples. Go raise up more disciples. I declare this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome aboard. God bless you. Good to see you. Amen. Amen. You're going to love this guy. Hallelujah. We're so glad to have you on the team as we are our team members. God's doing a good thing here. We make sure we don't get in the way of it. Amen. Amen. When uh, Moses told God to tell his brother Aaron to go tell his sons to go speak this over the people. And God said to Moses, and when they do that, I'll write, they'll be writing my name on them. And God says, and I'll do it. Amen. <laughs> God says, I'll do it. It's like Brother Hagin. I believe when I see it, I'm going to give you that church. I believe when I see it, you watch. To what God's called us to, you watch. Amen. Amen. Unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. Sometimes you just got to lay back and say, all right, God, go ahead. Let it roll. He said, tell this to these people. And then God says, I'll do it. The Lord bless you and keep you. You know, this really fulfilled in Jesus. Everything that this thing says has been given to us through the blood of Jesus. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine before you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance, which means face to face, and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace, both now and forever. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. James, you're up there ready to jump. What's up? Hallelujah. James quit smoking about three and a half weeks ago, right? Woo! Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And that, that, means, that means everything, cigarettes and everything. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow at Bible study. We love you. And Jesus is Lord of our life. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you again for being our guest here on The Voice of Healing. When you're in Charlotte, North Carolina, join us for our 10 a.m. Sunday morning service. Our website, restoringplace.org, has all the details on how to find us. While you're on our site, check out ways you can volunteer at the Dream Center. Need someone to answer questions about us or to pray with you 24-7? Call our prayer line. 